Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. A love that we can count on always being there. Help us, Lord, to really understand. We pray today we may catch an insight that we may carry us through the next week and into the new year. Bless us as we open our minds and our hearts to you. May we be drawn to your great love. May we understand what it means in terms of not only our salvation, but in the helping of others. We pray for guidance now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, here we are, the last Sabbath of the year, 2007. <laughs> it seems to, like we just started. <laughs> there it went. <laughs> We've been talking this year. We started on what obedience might mean. And we found that obedience is not just keeping rules. Obedience is just doing what the Lord tells you at any particular time. That's obedience. And then we moved on into how to be a soul winner, what it means to be a soul winner. And the fact that every Christian has it in them to want to foster the kingdom of God. And we've been working our way through some thoughts with that. We're not done with that yet. We're still moving through it. We started talking just a couple of uh, times ago about Jesus as the intercessor. The fact that we need an intercessor right now. <laughs> that when we were justified, the devil wasn't done with us. <laughs> and of course, God wasn't done with us either. Justification put us into the school of Christ. And that's where we are right now. We're learning in that school, and we don't graduate from that school until he comes back. <laughs> so it's an ongoing thing. We are constantly growing, constantly developing, constantly moving. When you stop, you're dead. <laughs> if we stop moving forward, there's only one other place to go. <laughs> So we have to have it in our mind to constantly be developing. Now, I'm sure you have had the experiences. I also have the experience of reading a scripture you've read hundreds of times. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the lights come on and you see something you never saw before in that scripture. And you thought you had milked it. <laughs> Well, I, I had that experience this week in a strange, strange place. <laughs> a scripture that just, I thought I knew what it said. <laughs> it's over there in uh, John 14, verse 43. And you know, I have this scripture underlined in many of the Spirit of Prophecy quotations. 1423. But I noticed as I went through looking at the places that I've marked that I did not mark the place that struck me this week. <laughs> uh, let's look at it there. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now you say, well, <laughs> we read that before. <laughs> we know what that says. 
But do you know what struck me? Now, last week we were talking about, it's about the Father. Okay? When we pray, we pray to the Father. The Father is God. Jesus is the medium by which the Father reconciled us to himself. The plan of salvation is to put us and the Father together. And Jesus and everything he did on this earth as a human was revealing the Father. <laughs> and it was the Father's Spirit working in him and through him that we see. And so we tried to point out that it seems that we do not think enough about the Father in all of this. Some people, I think, even have the idea that the Father is angry about something <laughs> and he needs to have Jesus get between us and him so everything can be all right. <laughs> but that's not the Father. <laughs> and so as I was looking at this scripture, I mean, I knew all the facts. That's not the idea here. The facts are clear, they're plain. But something just really struck me in light of what we were talking about last time. Let's look at it again. My father will love him and, what's the next word? We. Now we know that gospel says Christ in you, the hope of glory. We know that, Colossians. But that's not what this scripture says. Jesus says, we, the Father and I, both will come to you and we will take up our abode in you. We, our. So when you became a Christian, the Father God, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sovereign. You just can't go any further than that. God the Father took up his residence in you with Jesus. I don't know what that says to you, but it just really struck me. <laughs> The Father. And it still does. It does things to me. <laughs> if the Father honors us that way, <laughs> how should we be towards him? <laughs> the next verse, you want to see the next verse? Okay, the next verse is good too. He that loveth me not, uh, keepeth not my sayings, and my word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things. Now, did you notice that I use the word it there because in the Greek, the word he and it are interchangeable. Now, do you see what Jesus is talking about through here? He is talking about the Father. The Father. We will come to you. The Father and I. Jesus and the Father. You will have a comforter. Well, what is that comforter? It's the Spirit of God. Now, don't go theological here. Just stay with what Jesus is talking about, how he's moving with things. And don't start raising all kinds of weird questions. 
Don't you see what a privilege it is to have the Spirit of God, the Father, come to you? <laughs> Don't start inventing things you can't handle and you can't answer problems. You're, you're never going to answer the problems that people raise about things they don't know anything about. But Jesus says, we will come to you. Leave it there. <laughs> That's enough, isn't it? The Father in Jesus in you? <laughs> Maybe I should read something in the spirit of prophecy <laughs> to help us with this. This scripture is tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like like a bolt of lightning hit me when I read it and saw, wait a minute, there's something here I have not been looking at. <laughs> In volume seven of the testimonies, let me get over there. In volume seven of the testimonies, page 273, I want to read you something that God himself wants us to know. It's something that was written down by his messenger for us. It has to be right. As, I'm quoting now, as the divine endowment, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples so it will today be given to all who seek a right. Now, did you notice the word it? So it will. <laughs> Holy Spirit, it, be given to those who seek a right. This power alone is able to make us wise unto salvation and fit us for the courts above. Christ wants to give us a blessing that will make us holy. These things I have spoken unto you, he says, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 15, 11. Joy in the Holy Spirit is health-giving, life-giving joy. Now listen. This is the next sentence. In giving us his spirit, God gives us himself. <laughs> Is that doing anything for you? <laughs> In giving us his spirit, he's giving us himself. That's what Jesus said in John 14. We will come to you, the Father and I. We will take up our abode in you. And how do they do that? By the Spirit. <laughs> in giving us his Spirit, God gives us himself, making himself a fountain of divine influences to give health and life to the world. Divine what? Influences. The Spirit of God. Divine influences. There's tremendous material here if we don't try to go theological. <laughs> Just open your mind. Open your heart. Let God talk to you. Let him tell you what he's saying. He says, God the Father comes to live in you by his spirit. <laughs> well, it's tremendous. <laughs> So you can know right now the Father is in you because of the merits of Jesus Christ.
I think I'm going to go back and look at a couple more things with you. In the book, Fundamentals of Education, page 124 and following, I'm just going to pick out a couple of thoughts as we go through here, and I'll make some quotations when we get closer to where we're going here. It says, we have a definite mission. Now, we've been talking about that mission. The first Sabbath of this year, we talked about Acts of the Apostles, page in the book is page 11. It's the first page in the book. <laughs> it says, the church was organized for service. That's right up there, the first sentence. The church. What is the church? Christians. That's the church. It's not the building. It's not the denomination. It's not. The church was organized for service. The people, the Christians, the members were organized. That's what makes a church, the gathering. They're organized for what purpose? Is it to go to church every Sabbath and sit there? <laughs> Is that why we were baptized, so we could go to church and sit there? <laughs> Was it to have potlucks? Church socials? Why were we baptized into Christ? To have his life, and what is his life? To save souls. <laughs> you became a Christian to cooperate with Jesus in the work of saving souls. That's just the first sentence in Acts of the Apostles, and then it goes from there. <laughs> All right, so it says here, we have a definite mission. Well, there are lots of things that are not part of our mission that we can get involved in. <laughs> but we need to remember, we have a definite mission. We are the church organized for service. God provides, provided the seed and the soil, the sun and the rain. And if a farmer goes out there and he doesn't do anything, what kind of a harvest is he going to have? <laughs> well, the sun is there. The rain is there. <laughs> the ground is there. The seed is there. Everything is there, but no harvest. Why? <laughs> no worker. <laughs> So God has provided everything. I'm skipping down. I'm going to read a sentence. It says, they are not using the provisions of the heavenly Father. Tune in to wherever you see the word Father now. Okay? The heavenly Father and they can expect nothing but meager returns. The Holy Spirit will not compel men to take a certain course of action. The provisions of the Heavenly Father, she calls the Holy Spirit here. You are waiting in idle expectation that God will perform some wonderful miracle to enlighten the world in regard to truth. I want to ask you, if you have employed the means God has provided for the advancement of his cause. You pray for light and truth from heaven. Have you studied the scriptures? <laughs> That's a simple one, isn't it? <laughs> we want light? Do we really want light? Where are we spending our time? Okay. Have you desired the sincere milk of the word? Have you submitted yourselves to the revealed command, thou shalt? and thou shalt not. They are definite requirements. 
You who mourn your spiritual dearth, do you seek to know and to do the will of God? Are you doing battles? She asks. You know, you can talk to people in churches everywhere. And when you start talking about doing, that's where they start falling off. <laughs> well, wait a minute. It's all by grace. No works. I don't do anything. Jesus does everything. <laughs> well, he, he gives the sun. He gives the rain. He gives the seed. He gives the <laughs> but there's going to be nothing happening if we don't do something. Then she says this, wrench yourself away from hurtful associations. Wrench? Well, I guess that's the right word. It's never easy to move away from something that's become a habit. It's never easy. Nobody's ever figured out a way to say, well, today I'm going to stop thinking that way. <laughs> wrench! Wrench, pull yourself, do something. Count the cost of following Jesus. You mean there's a cost? <laughs> I thought it was free. <laughs> yeah, we know there's a cost, don't we? Salvation comes to us through justification as an absolute free gift. We don't have anything to do. There's nothing we can do. But once you're in, now, did you really want it? <laughs> There's where the cost is. Count the cost. Is Jesus worth it? What a question. <laughs> what a question. <laughs> Make it. This cost counting with a determined purpose to cleanse yourselves. God speaks in unmistakable language to your soul. Now, he's not doing that from the throne. He's not doing that from a billion light years away. Where is he doing it from? Right inside of you. The Father is there. We mustn't turn this into an abstraction. This is a reality that the Heavenly Father and Jesus both are inside of us, talking to us, guiding us, directing. Those who humbly and prayerfully search the scriptures to know and to do God's will, will not be in doubt about their obligations to God. See, no doubt. No doubt. Um, if you love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, in passing one time, we talked about the word keep. I want to review that just a little bit. We seem to get the idea that the word keep means I'm doing it. That is not what the word keep means. The word keep means to keep it ever before you in remembrance. It's not something you have to try to recall. It's just always there. <laughs> when you keep the fourth commandment, how many days are you involved in that? Seven days a week. You are preparing for the next Sabbath just as soon as the sun goes down on Sabbath. You're getting ready for the next one already. 
and all through the week. You're saying, well, there's five days to the Sabbath. There's four days to the Sabbath. There's three days. This is the day of preparation. <laughs> Your whole life is lived with reference to the Sabbath because you keep it. It's always there. <laughs> And so that's what Jesus is saying. He who keeps my word. In other words, it's always there. Always in the memory. Always. And Jesus says, if you keep my words, if it's just always there in front of you, it's part of you, it's just your life. My Father will love you, and we're going to come live with you, both of us. <laughs> And by the way, I be really believe if we can get a hold of this, that the Father and the Son are both there. That we're going to find power in the life we didn't have before. Because it will always be a conscious thing. Father, anything goes wrong. Father! God means for it to be a power. You know, when the devil went out there in the wilderness to tempt Jesus, what kind of a thing was that that the devil was doing? Have you thought about what kind of... Gall is that, that he would go out where Jesus was and pretend that he was an angel from God. <laughs> I mean, how brazen is that? <laughs> to stand in front of Jesus and say, I'm here to help you out, the Father sent me. <laughs> this beautiful angel, angel of light, Minister of righteousness. Well, you know, now that he's been unmasked before the universe, I really doubt that he's ready to approach the Father and the Son in you that way. <laughs> There's only one way that the devil has any opportunity to come at us. That's if we make the opening. If we say, or we don't have to say anything, we just forget that the Father and Jesus are there. Now, I really can understand how a person in the press of life can forget about religion for a few minutes. I can understand that. I can understand how a person could even not think about Jesus for a few seconds. But the way this scripture is impacting on me, I really find it difficult to believe that a person who is thinking about the Father and Jesus in them all the time is going to have that kind of a problem. It's a different dynamic. To know that at any second, you're not saying to Jesus, tell the Father something for me. No, the Father's right there. It's, Father! <laughs> it's immediate. No waiting. No wondering. Father, we will come to him and make our abode with him. Here are the conditions upon which every soul will be elected to eternal life. Your obedience to God's commandments. Now, what are those commandments? It's whatever he's telling you in your life right then. It's not going to be different than the Ten Commandments, by the way. <laughs> it's going to be the same thing. They prove your right to an inheritance. Let me get down here. If you would inherit the rest remaineth for the children of God, you must become a co-laborer with God 
With who? With the Father. You must work with the Father. Not working for Him. I've heard lots of people talk about things that way. I was at a workers meeting, 120 ministers, and they were all talking about working for God. I had to remind them, you don't work for God. You don't do anything for God. You are cooperating with Him. You're working with Him or nothing happens. <laughs> you are elected to wear the yoke of Christ, to bear His burden, to lift his cross. You are diligent to make your calling and election sure. Search the scriptures and you will see that not a son or a daughter of Adam is elected to be saved in disobedience. Does that make sense? God doesn't go through all this so that people can be saved in their disobedience. He doesn't do it that way. The world makes void the law of God, but Christians are chosen to sanctification through obedience to the truth. They are elected to bear the cross if they would wear the crown. I know this isn't news to any of you, but the, the part that I'm trying to talk about here is that this all works if you have the Father with you in a conscious way and you, you, you just know that's what it is. Okay, I want to go someplace else now. Desire of Ages. 277. Oh, I have to get rid of something here, the computer. Oh, okay. Desire of Ages 277. The discussion begins with Levi Matthew. Now, you all remember who Levi Matthew was. He was a tax collector. <laughs> he was a Jewish tax collector. <laughs> the Romans, of course, were the real tax collectors, but they hired these Jews because they knew everybody. And they hired them to collect the taxes for the empire. But these people, once they were hired, had their own little trick. They made money on the side for themselves. So they not only collected taxes for Rome, they collected money for themselves. And they were really a low bunch of people, <laughs> these collectors. The Jewish nation hated these people. I mean, they really hated them. They were so corrupt. How could they work for the Romans and take money away from their brethren? <laughs> That's who Matthew was. He was one of those. He was well hated. <laughs> well, we know how the story goes. Jesus had already taken four disciples, and he sent out the invitation for the fifth one, Matthew. He did it in a most interesting way. He was walking by. <laughs> and he just said two words. Follow me. What do you suppose Matthew did? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Have you ever wondered? What in the world was wrong with him? Why did he just leave all his money, his position, his potential? And he just got up immediately and followed Jesus. Is that the way we did it? <laughs> now, we had to take 28 Bible studies. <laughs> 
<laughs> we had to ask all these questions. We had to go check with people to see, is that really true? <laughs> and when there was no place else to go, <laughs> we finally said, well, I guess that's the right church. <laughs> But Matthew got up, and that was it. He never turned back. What was wrong with him? <laughs> Matthew, how did he do that? You know, he wasn't the only one. Jesus did that with several of the other ones. Just That's all he said to them. It's follow me. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't say it in the stories, but I think between the scripture we read and some of the things that Ellen White said, we can put it together. The Father had already been there. His Spirit had been working on these people before they heard that follow me. And it was the Spirit of the Father drawing these people, showing them who Jesus was that made them able to do what they did. And the only way we will ever get really get a hold of this, the solid way we want, we really earnestly desire to be like these people, is to listen to what the Father is saying to us. But we need to know it's Him. Don't go flitting off in some abstraction trying to figure out who's talking to me. Is that a ghost? Is that a whatever? <laughs> it's the Father. That's all you need to know. He can't fool you. <laughs> he means what he says. He has the right to because Jesus has earned that right. The blood is doing its work. Well, Jesus, after he called Matthew, and had some interesting things happen. Some people came to see him. They were disciples of John the Baptist. Now, you know about John the Baptist. There are lots of things he wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink wine. He wore really plain clothes. <laughs> and he taught his disciples a certain way. And these disciples were very serious. They fasted, maybe even twice a week. And when John the Baptist found himself in prison, they were waiting for Jesus to get him out of there, and Jesus wasn't doing anything. And they said, well, wait a minute. What is this? Why doesn't he go over there to help him? Why doesn't he do something? <laughs> And so John the Baptist sent them over and said, go talk to him. Let's see what he has to say. <laughs> and so they made their way over there. And Jesus, whenever somebody invited him home to dinner or for a feast, he went. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? He went. <laughs> And so these disciples came to him and said, oh, we fast, and, and your, your master, he goes to dinners. <laughs> How come he doesn't fast? How come you don't fast? You go to the parties too. <laughs> we fast. <laughs> so you can see, what the devil was trying to set up here. Now, 
Jesus, of course, knew this was going on. He heard them, so he answered the question. And he did it in the most interesting way. He said, you know, when the bridegroom is here, <laughs> who's going to fast when the bridegroom is present? And they knew that made sense because John the Baptist had said something like that. And Jesus then said, there'll be plenty of time to mourn when the bridegroom's gone. Then you can fast. <laughs> that, by the way, is a rationale for fasting today. We suffer. We do things. There's, there's good reason for fasting today done the Bible way. But the fasting that Jesus taught is not the fasting that people do today. They, they think it's about food. It's not about food. Fasting is one of the ways God has given us to show we're in control. And of course, for many people, Probably most people on this earth, uh, food has a very strong pull because we need to survive, <laughs> okay? It's just not an option. We have to eat. But it's a matter of getting control of things in such a way that we can say, I am not living for myself. This is what Jesus proved in that first temptation. The statement he really made to the universe was, I would rather die then eat something my father didn't tell me to eat. And when the devil saw that, it surprised him because he'd never seen a human being like that before. I would rather die than do something my father didn't say to do. That's quite a thought, isn't it? Well, Jesus gained the victory for all of us. We can do that spiritually now. We can say that in his spirit, in his power. Now, we can't do it ourselves. We don't have that capacity, but he's already done it. He can do it again in us if we give him an opportunity. That's not our subject today. But I want you to know that everything Jesus did on earth as a human being, we can do with the same spirit. And you don't have to wait for that spirit to come. We just read, the Father is in you already. <laughs> so it's a matter of tapping into the provisions. Everything is there. We don't invent anything. We don't create anything. It's already in place. When he should come forth from the tomb, their sorrow would be turned to joy. After his ascension, he was to be absent in person. But through the Comforter, he would still be with them. And they were not to spend their time mourning. This was what Satan wanted. He desired them to give the world the impression that they had been deceived and disappointed. But by faith, they were to look to the sanctuary above where Jesus was ministering for them. They were to open their hearts to the Holy Spirit, his representative, and to rejoice in the light of his presence. Whose presence? Jesus. Through the Spirit that proceeds from the Father. Isn't that what he said? I will pray the Father that he send you the Spirit that proceeds from the Father. All right, I'm going to read now what she says about a true fast. The true fast is no mere formal service. The scripture describes the fast that God has chosen. To loose the bands of wickedness.
See, a fast is not starving yourself to death. The reason for a fast is to show yourself I can do this so that I get this result to loose the bands of wickedness, to get control, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke, to draw out thy soul to the hungry, and to satisfy the afflicted soul. In other words, to be a soul winner. That's why you're fasting. But did you recognize where I was reading from? Hey, that's the section on who keeps the Sabbath. <laughs> Here is set forth the very spirit and work, character and work of Christ. All right, here's a sentence you need to hear. His whole Life was a sacrifice of himself for the saving of the world. Whether fasting in the wilderness of temptation or eating with publicans, he was giving his life. Have you got your mind wrapped around that? Jesus was fasting when he was eating. <laughs> because he was giving his life while he was doing that. Not in idle a morning and mere bodily humiliation and multitudinous sacrifices is the true spirit of devotion manifested, but it is shown in the surrender of self in willing service to God and man. That's what Christianity is. It's not giving up this or giving up that. That's not surrender. Surrender is not saying, Lord, uh, you can move me over there or you can move me over there or I will give up this job or I will deny myself this. That's not surrender. Surrender is willing service to God and to man. That's what surrender is. <laughs> willing service. So we can see that Satan has made us look at words in certain ways and think that we're complying with certain conditions when we need to go back and try to understand them more clearly. 2008 is just around the corner here. I wonder how many of us here really down deep thought we were ever going to reach 2008. <laughs> I have to say it never occurred to me. <laughs> I thought it was something when we reached the year 2000. <laughs> I still remember that. But 2008? And you know, I went down to the DMV. My license ran out, driver's license. And it shocked me when I looked at the license they handed me. I never thought I was going to get another license. <laughs> But now I have my new license, and it expires in 2015. <laughs> I can't even imagine it. <laughs> 2015. And who knows? It may be <laughs> that some of us will be there. <laughs> 2015. <laughs> But you know, we all of us have a certain amount of time. And uh, that's the amount of time we need to be doing something. The priests and the rulers weren't getting any of this. 
the apostles were having a hard time, but the priests and rulers just were not getting any of this. I want to read a sentence here. It says, they were fixed in a rut of ceremonies and traditions. <laughs> That's a terrible thing, isn't it? Be fixed in a rut. Their hearts had become contracted like the dried up wineskins. They were like dried up prunes. And while they remained satisfied with the legal religion, it was impossible for them to become the depositories of the living truth of heaven. They thought their own righteousness all sufficient, and they did not desire that a new element should be brought into their religion. I mean, they felt good. We go to church every Sabbath. We show up to a prayer meeting every now and then. We always go in gathering. <laughs> And we sure don't miss those potlucks. I want to read this sentence in light of this last week. The goodwill of God to men, they did not accept as something apart from themselves. They connected it with their own merit because of their good works. Now that sentence went by very, very fast. It says, the good will of God. Well, when was that sounded in the heavens? The good will of men, or God towards men. It's when Jesus was born. When Jesus was born, that was the announcement. This is the goodwill of God. <laughs> this is the Father sending your salvation. <laughs> Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. <laughs> These are more than songs and more than stories. <laughs> it's who the Father is. Goodwill. Do you sense that coming from God? Or do you have some blocks up yet? Do you know that God only has one thing towards you? Good will. That's all you should think about when you think about God. Good will. Now, we certainly have problems. Okay, we can say that. <laughs> we have the flesh, yes. We know who we are. But that doesn't change God. With him, it's goodwill. Goodwill. I'm going to read the next sentence now. The faith that works by love and purifies the soul could find no place for union with the religion of the Pharisees made up of ceremonies and the injunctions of men. Now, I'm reading this to you because as you go out to do soul winning, you are going to run into religious people who don't want to hear a thing you're saying because they are satisfied with their position in their church, with their minister, and they don't care to know about light, some of them. This is why. Because the real religion of Jesus Christ the faith that comes from him purifies the soul. <laughs> and we need to be able to present that to them. <laughs> the Pharisees thought themselves too wise. Now you're going to bump into that. <laughs> they were too wise to need instruction. <laughs> They were too righteous to need salvation. <laughs> I'm saved. Stop talking about sin. <laughs> they were too highly honored to need the honor that comes from Christ. This is all part of soul winning. You need to know that's what you're going to meet. You mustn't have it yourself. <laughs> you must know 
The Lord is delivering you from all these things. And so, Jesus talking about old bottles and new wine. He said, you can't put that new wine in those old bottles. That piece of leather that's so brittle will just crack and you'll lose everything. And so what did he say you have to do? You've got to put that new wine in a new bottle. So he didn't go to the leaders of the church. He didn't go to the Pharisees and the scribes and all the brilliant men who studied theology. Where did he go? To the common people, new bottles. And he put his new wine in those new bottles. He found his new bottles for the new wine. The instrumentalities to be used in the gospel work are those souls who gladly receive the light which God sends them. Now you know who you're supposed to be talking to. Don't ever force anybody to listen to you. <laughs> Don't beat somebody over the head with your joy. You just keep shuffling around, moving around, doing the exposing until you find somebody who wants to know something and that's the person you want to talk to because God has prepared them. They're the ones who will listen. You don't have to force them. They will be listening. They will gladly receive the light these are his agencies for imparting the knowledge of truth to the world. If through the grace of Christ his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine. That's us. <laughs> See? Let's be the new bottles. Let's accept whatever he gives us. Let's be happy to receive whatever he tells us so that we can go out and share it with somebody. Now, the Lord has given us a lot of things to think about. We won't talk about those today. We're kind of inching our way over to them. <laughs> it's called reform. We are a people of reform. We are not a people of bench warmers. <laughs> We're a people of reform. And reform means you change your ways. <laughs> There's dress reform. There's educational reform. Yeah, there's health reform. <laughs> we are people of reform. At least we used to be. I hope we're getting back there. <laughs> reform. And we don't do reform to be saved. Some people get the wrong bent on that. We do reform because we love being where God wants us to be. We, we love doing what he tells us because we know it's the best. And we know it does things that we, it wouldn't happen any other way. Until emptied, of the old traditions, customs, and practices, they had no place in mind or heart for the teachings of Christ. They clung to the dead forms, and they turned away from living truth and the power of God. Thousands are making the same mistake as did the Pharisees, whom Christ reproved at Matthew's feast. Rather than give up some cherished idea are there any people among us who have cherished ideas that they don't want to give up? <laughs> oh, that list just pops up. <laughs> cherished ideas. <laughs> or discard some idol of opinion. Now, we are all entitled to our opinion, okay, as far as that goes between me and me. But my opinion shouldn't go any further than my nose. When it, when it comes to you. 
<laughs> okay. When we talk, we better be in the Word. We better see what God said. And even then, we shouldn't tell each other what it means. We should just share our ideas, and the Spirit will teach us. But cherished ideas, idle opinions, many refuse the truth that comes down from the Father of light. And we all know about that one. I mean, the most obvious one, the Sabbath. As soon as you start saying something about the Sabbath, you should get all the excuses. I was talking to two young fellows just the other day, and that was the first question I asked them. I said, do you believe in the commandments of God? They said, oh, yeah. Do you teach people to keep the commandments of God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, are we talking about the same thing in the Ten Commandments? Yes. <laughs> I said, well, that's, that's really great because Jesus said, he who teaches people to keep them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so as we talked a, a bit about it some more, we went through some of the commandments. They were right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And of course, you know what happened. We finally got to the fourth one. <laughs> and I asked them about that. I said, no, I don't want to put something in your way here, but I just want to know. I really believe you're sincere in thinking that uh, you were told something correctly here, but is it possible that you haven't read it for yourself? And so we read it together. And I said, you know, the place where you're attending church right now, they're not saying this. And they both got kind of quiet. The one was very sharp. And after we had talked a bit, and he realized Saturday was a day and not Sunday, he says, oh, but Sunday's in the Bible. I said, oh, oh, let's look at it. Show me the scripture. He went to Matthew 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, <laughs> at midnight, Paul was preaching. And they broke bread. He said, see, there it is. That's a Sunday. I said, yes, that's a Sunday. They're in church breaking bread. They're, they're having the sacrament. That's what he said. And I looked at him. I said, well, you know, it's an interesting thing. If you want to look at the same author writing on the same subject in the same book, go over to Acts 2.42. And that's what we did. They went from house to house breaking bread daily. <laughs> and both of them just sat there. Boom! I said, no, that doesn't mean they were in church every day, does it? <laughs> house to house, they had church in every house, eating bread. And they both realized somebody told them wrong. And that's as far as we needed to go. I just... Ask them if they would pray that God would reveal to them what he really had to say in his word because there's a lot more than the Sabbath involved in the Bible. The whole plan of salvation is being distorted out there in the name of Bible religion. We don't need to join any of that. We need to be very careful that what we believe is really what the Word of God says and what has been revealed to this people in particular. My wife and I were talking the other day about some of the tapes that are going around. And we both just wondered, well, you know, where is that ever going to end? All the strange things are being said on some of these tapes. We all of us, I think, need to step back and realize that the Father being in us, Jesus being in us, will teach us as much as any person you're going to listen to on a tape. He will talk to you personally. He will reveal to you personally what he wants you to know. 
And once you receive something from the Father and Jesus Christ, you don't ever need to be concerned about them changing their mind later. <laughs> you will have something that is truth forever. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean we should go out and fight for what God has revealed to us, but we should rejoice in it. <laughs> yeah, let God have some room with somebody else. I mean, if it took me 40 years to see that in that text, <laughs> maybe I can afford to let somebody else get there 40 years to finally get there. <laughs> we just need to share and keep pointing people to Jesus and let them know the Father loves them and he's there too. Okay, we... Need a minute or two here before we finish today. There was a word in here I wanted to read. Here it is. Still talking about the Pharisees. There's a quotation here from Revelation 3, the Laodicean condition. And then this statement. Faith and love are the gold tried in the fire. Faith and love. But with many the gold has become dim and the rich treasure has been lost. The righteousness of Christ is to them a robe unworn, a fountain untouched. These are the people we're looking for to try to get them to understand what it means to really wear the robe of Christ's righteousness. We'll try to get into some of that next time. Man must be emptied of self before he can be in the fullest sense a believer in Jesus. When self is renounced, then the Lord can make man a new creature. New bottles can contain the new wine. The love of Christ will animate the believer with new life. And so I think that's a good place to close for today. The year 2008 is on us. And it seems like we can never stop seeking that new life. <laughs> it's always right there, a little bit more, a little bit more, that new life, new life. And today I would like to encourage you to read John 14, 23 carefully and let it speak to you that the Father and the Son said they will come to you and take up their abode in you. And if you need any more than that, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> the Father and the Son. And then just every day, wake up and say, Father, thank you for being with me. And all through the day, when things come up, you feel yourself getting a little bit grumpy. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> Throw up that quick prayer. Father, I need your spirit touching me in a way I can understand right now. And it will happen. He's just waiting for us to talk to him, to constantly be tapping in. I'd like to take just a minute 